Welcome back to the show. Today we have UV Daigle. He's the CEO at Life in It. UV, De welcome to the show. <clears throat> hey, thanks very much, Kevin. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on the show. I, I think what you guys are doing is actually really innovative and, and super important and, and can be life saving, really. But maybe before we kind of get into that, um, let's get to know you a little bit better and cover kind of where you grew up and kind of how you got to where you are now. Of course. Uh, well, I mean, uh, when I was a kid, I moved every four years of my life. My parents liked to move a lot. So I lived, I was born in New Zealand, lived in US, then Canada, not too far from where you live right now, sure. Ken. Yeah. And then I moved yeah. to South Africa when I was 16. And I spent 22 years in South Africa. Very cool. And in 20, uh, the first half of my life, until the age of 26, I was a concert pianist, which sounds really cool and romantic, and was actually cool and romantic. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> And then at the age of 26, I had an accident and I paralyzed my right arm. So I recycled myself into medical research. And since then, I've been manufacturing medical products. So for the last 30 years, yes, I am that old, Kevin. I know I look young, but I'm really old. That's but awesome, for the last 30 years, I've been doing R&D research, developing medical products. So first was a company called Microlife. Okay. Then I uh, bought a French company called Spengler, which was the inventor of the blood pressure monitor. Right. And then in 2008, for my sins, I uh, started a company called iHealth, which <laughs> was basically the beginning of the revolution of connected health. Sure. And last year, I resigned from iHealth in September 2016 to start the Life in a Project. So... No, that that's great, man. I, I think that's that's really cool. And if you if anybody wants kind of a longer kind of history and background, you are on the radio version, and they can go go to the show's website and check that out. But Absolutely. I really think that what you're doing with life in a is is super important and really cool. So what exactly is it, and why did you decide to start it up? Well, you know, Kevin, the, the best ideas are often driven by personal needs. Sure. Uh, what happened is I, I moved to France, and France is a wonderful country to live, if you speak French. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> and when I moved here, my brother Olaf came to visit me from New Zealand, and he's a type 1 diabetic. And I don't know if you know that people with diabetes hate to travel. Sure. Because their incident always has to be kept cool. So he came here, and while he was here, he went to visit some chateaus in the south of France, tourism sure. and the hotel where he was accidentally froze his insulin luckily we're in france so at 11 o'clock at night he could get some fresh insulin from the night pharmacy sure. he came back to paris and he told me about the moron who'd frozen his insulin he was actually moron was not the, the word that he used he was pretty pissed sure. off <laughs> <laughs> and so he came back and uh, literally just for fun we decided to design the idea of a little fridge a portable fridge the size of a mobile phone so that he could carry his insulin. And okay. on paper, it worked. Sure. So we made a prototype. I stole the battery from a Sony video scope to make a, a video cam to make a prototype. And it worked. But it was originally, we just made it for personal private use. Sure. But then every time we showed it to somebody, they would like, ooh, and ah, and say it's the best thing since butter slicing thread. So I started doing a lot of R&D. And then I discovered something really amazing is that basically there's about 5% of the population that is prisoner of its medication. Sure. So medication that has to be kept in the fridge at all times, so which means that these people have great difficulty in taking the plane and traveling and going long distance anywhere. Sure. So, and the biggest side effect of this is that most people have this medication and they don't take their medication to work with them because nobody wants people to know that they suffer from multiple sclerosis or that, sure. you know, these are horrible diseases. Sure. So that instead of taking their medication to work, they leave it at, at home which means they take the medication late and they have a non-adherence problem to medication. And non-compliance or non-adherence basically costs $350 billion in the U.S. Wow. It's, the, it's enormous. Yeah, so crazy. this is basically what our first version looks like. See how sexy it is. Sure, it's it looks so really good, cool. man. Yeah. And it's got a 36-hour battery, so you can basically go anywhere, any place, and it's a clip-on battery, so if you want an extra battery, you just clip it on. It'll keep everything you put inside between 2 and 8 degrees. And it also works really great for little vodka bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the awesome. whole idea of life now. And to make these fridges that give people the freedom to travel, to go anywhere. And quite frankly, Kevin, I've made a lot of products in my life. You know, I've made literally hundreds of products. But it's the first time in my life that I make a product where people are actually thanking me for selling them a product, which is 
amazingly cool. Sure. That that's very cool actually. And and I think like for people that don't have some sort of like medical condition, I like the they don't really even think about how much of a need this really is, right? And I, I think the other thing too is there's you could kind of take this in any d- direction. I also think it's really cool that um, you, when, when we talked originally, you mentioned that you've built it so you, it's basically safe to take on a plane that'll pass through security. Um, you know, I, I don't really care about the political side in, in the show, but like, you know, that's super important, right? Being able to get this through security, making sure that people can actually travel with the thing. And you've built kind of proto- different prototypes and you had to change the battery you mentioned to me. Absolutely, before. yeah. And, and so walk us through kind of the process of actually building a little fridge. Well, it was, it's actually a lot more complicated, complicated than what people may, people may think. To make a little working fridge for home use is relatively simple sure. because you just make it with bits of cardboard and string and a battery and you stick it together. But that's just basically a working sample for private use sure. with maybe a three, four hour battery life, whereas now we've made it into a state of the art device. The biggest problem was producing cold for long enough and was using as little energy as possible. And for that, uh, I had to reinvent the wheel using a thing called the Peltier effect, thermoelectric effects, that were invented by a French guy called Jean Athanas Peltier. I mean, only French people have got names like Athanas. Yeah, yeah. I I have some family in uh, Quebec, or just outside Quebec City, so I I totally get that. (laughs) (laughs) So Jean Athanas Peltier discovered in 1832 that if you take cubes of metal of different density and you like weld them together yeah. and you pass an electric current through it, the friction between the different metals will cause super heat on one side and super cold on the other, That's cool. which is today vulgarly called the Peltier effect or thermoelectrics. But they were notoriously unstable because if, as soon as there was a particle of air between them, uh, the air would expand faster, and the thing would, after 80 hours, it would start bursting and stop working. Okay, so interesting. So I developed a new technology to, be, to make vacuum, I mean, petty effects under vacuum. So now we're on at 9,700 hours of continuous use. Wow. So we're good. <laughs> wow, yeah. Like, basically get anywhere in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, now we've licked that technology. The next step was to, to make a product... Not that, uh, I mean, I, I always think about, what the, my, rethink the time that I bought my first iPhone. Sure. You know, I call it yeah. the wow factor. That you open the box and you think, wow, I'm just so happy to have bought this device. You know, this perfect packaging delivered without an instruction book, with the battery preloaded, basically plug and play the first time. So I work a lot on this intuitivity, the fact that I want people to just open the box and to be systematically delighted with what they buy. Sure. I mean, uh, so uh, this is basically going to be the fourth big business that I've started. And for this one, I've put all the dots on all the eyes to make an absolutely perfect product with a lifetime warranty. I've, I've redesigned it also at the beginning of the year because at the beginning of the year, I wanted to have an integrated battery inside. But as you know, because of the anti-terror things all over the U.S., they're now even saying that maybe next year you won't be able to put your laptop computer on the plane. Sure. You know? yeah. So I redesigned it to have a separate clip on, uh, on battery. And at the same time, I redesigned it so it can be assembled like a Lego system. That's you awesome. just go clack, 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 and you just assemble it. And so I'm having all the components made in Eastern Europe. Okay. And then I'm having them brought into Paris. And I'm having them assembled by handicapped people in France. That's which amazing, is really, dude. I mean, it's really... Look... It does cost three, four dollars more per product to have it assembled by the handicapped people, but at the same time, we're giving jobs to people who need it a lot more than you and me need it. Very much. You know, so, yeah. so, and I've found that basically anybody's prepared to pay. Uh, I don't want people to buy my product because it's cheap anyway. I want them to buy it because they want to buy it. Sure. So, but well, the, the, you're basically adding what the cost of a cup of coffee to the thing. Some, yeah, yeah, of sometimes course. that's yeah. even cheap. Like you go to Starbucks, you can get an eight dollar lemonade. So I, I totally get it, and and I'm guilty of that too. I like, drink Starbucks all the time, so I'm almost yeah. making fun of myself. But. <laughs> in, in, in reality, this four bucks is really not a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, the only problem, as you know, four four euro cost in manufacturing is going to reflect reflect more than maybe twenty thirty euro in retail sure. because sure. everything is sold 
via the cousin or the friend of the dog of Harry and everybody has an incremental margin. Gotcha. So, but again, the price doesn't matter. I mean, because, you know, the one thing that defines anybody with a chronic disease, and Kevin, basically a, a chronic disease is a disease that cannot be cured. Sure. You will have it for the rest of your life. Sure. You know, and so it cannot be cured, but it can be managed. Yep. So people who have a chronic disease are basically defined by their lifestyle. And yep. anything that makes them live better or normal, you know, becomes essential. Yep. If, you, if, you, if you visit our Facebook accounts or our LinkedIn and stuff, I have a lot of followers on Facebook for this project because it started to go viral sure. with the entire community of chronic patients. The first question that we get on the, on the Facebook is not how much does it cost, it's where can I buy it? Sure. That's the first question. The second question says, why didn't it exist before? And only the third question is, how much does it cost? Sure. And to answer the untold question, it will cost about 200 bucks. Okay. Is that US or Euros or, or what is that? It's basically the same. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, okay. I mean, basically, when Apple gives a price of $200 in the US, it's XVAT. Mm -hmm. And Europe you give 200 euro, but this includes VAT. So basically, more or less, it cancels itself out. So it's roughly the same price. Got you. Okay. So I, I guess, when can people get it? Do you, do you have a rough timeline of when you're going to actually start shipping these things? Uh, absolutely. So right now, I'm on my ninth generation of functional wow. prototypes. So I still have another two generations to do because I'm still working on a battery. I want to extend the battery life. Sure. And I'm still working a bit on the installation. So I'm turning the key of the production factory on the 10th of February, okay. 2018. So, I mean, I'm half Swiss, half German. You know, I like to be very... <laughs> <you know. laughs> no, I think <laughs> that's I great. Man. Product, so, uh, it's all carefully planned in terms sure. of timing, in terms of components. So we start the manufacturing on the 10th of February, which means that by the time it starts reaching the international market, it'll be end May, beginning of June. Oh, okay, before the, Which, just before the summer. No, that I think that's great. Kind of when everybody goes on summer vacation, right? Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's great. So, can people pre-order now, or are you still kind of it's too well, a little bit too uh, early? Uh, on Facebook, I've got about eight thousand seven hundred people who've told me they wanted to buy the product, and people sure. reassembled. But you know, I just had a, a bad experience, which was, uh, in fact it was a very great learning curve for me is that I, when I, I've done a lot of Indiegogo campaigns before a crowdfunding sure. yeah. and I've done three very successful ones, but really more for gadgets for iBaby and iSmart and the really cool stuff that people buy because it's, it's funky sure. and cool. And so I thought that for life in I'd do a crowdfunding campaign and I mounted a perfect campaign, complete with videos, dancing girls, the whole thing, everything you need. <laughs> you know, basically a perfect campaign. Sorry, I shouldn't say things like this, but I mean, no, you know what? It's all good, man. You know, and uh, with beautiful pictures and videos and explanations, and I launched it, and then I had eight thousand seven hundred people who had said they would order. Sure. And then the day I launched, basically nobody ordered. So I started writing to the people who had said that they were going to order, sure. and they all gave me the same reply. They said, Mr. Deagle, the day the product comes out, we'll be the first one to go buy it off the shelf. But we suffer from chronic diseases. Sure. We suffer today, actively, right now. If we buy something, we want to use it right now. Mm -hmm. We don't want to buy it on some in the never, never crowdfunding thing. Sure. So that was very, very surprising for me. So I did a complete analysis of Kickstarter in Indiegogo, and hold yourself tight, Kevin, there's never once in the entire history of Indiegogo and Kickstarter been a single campaign for chronic disease that has worked. Interesting. <laughs> you know, so it, it, crowdfunding is not really suited for chronic diseases. It sure. doesn't take away any of the value of the product. It's just that it's not the right platform. For me, crowdfunding is now really more of a communication platform more than anything else. Sure. But no, that makes sense. And I think the other thing, too, is people buy crowdfunding, they're like, it's almost like a dream product, right? Where sometimes they think that, well, I really want this, but if it doesn't happen for whatever reason, because that's happened a million times, yeah. that there there may be disappointment, but it's that you get over it. But where it's something where it's like can affect your day-to-day -day life, you're like, I just, just take my money now, right? It's kind of the... Yeah. The thing, right? So but I get that. That makes it's sense. It's quite interesting that you say this because 
I'm starting to see a kickback on the fact that, you know, that basically 80% of Indiegogo and Kickstarter products are never delivered. I know. Oh, it's, yeah. 80%, yeah. not 20%. 80% of them are just totally. bullshit. Yep. You know, I mean, are just basically nonsensical things. And, you know, I come from 20 years of clinical validations and medical culture and research and delivering on what I promise. Sure. And the problem is now it become too easy to actually launch a new product. Yeah. Any moron with a good idea goes and sticks it on Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which means that every two days you have a new magic product yeah, that yeah. comes up that says click, click, boom and promises you the the, the, the cure for everything. Yep. But in reality, these products don't really exist. But yep. it's tend to gadgetize the medical industry in the eyes of the people who need it the most. And that's the patient. Sure. No, that's that's interesting. But, but that's the several, several bottles of wine conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, man. So you were recently at the Web Summit and you have some kind of, you know, you, you guys got, well, you wanted some awards or an award. Well, so talk about that. Well, the, the, the Web Summit is the epiphany. It is the ultimate award. It's the biggest digital congress in the world in sure. Lisbon. Yep. It was just held last week. And out of the 1,300 startups, Lifeino was voted as best startup in the world. Congrats, you know, man. Which, that's, that's incredible, which was an actually. amazing thing because yeah. it allies that perfect combination of beautiful product with the beautiful, with the story, the need, the market, which sure. is ever expanding because there's more and more medications that are heat sensitive. The fact that we're a team of the best engineers, doctors, and we have a great track record. So we were voted as best startup of the world. They gave me not only a trophy, but they also gave me a check, one of those huge, you know, cardboard ones. Yeah, you know, yeah, they gave yeah. me a check for a thousand <laughs> euro, which is really quite amazing. First time I've ever gotten one. That's awesome. <laughs> did, did you keep it? Yeah, I've kept it, but it's in the office. It makes everybody <laughs> happy every time they look at it. You know, it was a real pain, I can tell you, to go on the plane. With a, you know, I sure. went on the plane. Everybody was congratulating me. And even when I got to the airport in the morning, the security guard, he said to me, Hey, I saw you on TV yesterday night. Well done. <laughs> was the first time ever I was happy that the police recognized me. <laughs> sure, yeah, I guess. Eh? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> no, I, that, that's really great, man. I, I think that, so, so walk me through, though, the process. Like, you, you kind of have an interesting story of how it kind of came to be. Yeah. So what, what, what happened, as I told you, my brother had his incident, so we decided to make, what, make a fridge. And uh, last, I had this in the back of my mind that this was a great idea. But when we invented the first prototype, I had other things to do because I was running iHealth, which was the world's largest connected healthcare company. So 1.4 billion euro company. You know, I had other things to worry about than this little fridge thing. And then last year, I did my 50-year crisis. You know, I was I figured I wanted to do something more meaningful. So I went and I bought Harley Davidson T-shirts and I climbed the Kilimanjaro and did all the the, the man the man 50-year-old stuff. And so I said, I want to look. I do not suffer from the Dr. Schweitzer complex. I'm not here to save the world and dig wells in Africa or anything. But at the same time, I want to make a business where I want to turn around in five years and say. Look what I did. Sure. You know, something I'm really proud about. Sure. And so I started doing some research on this and I discovered this incredible market and the need, the visceral need for these people to find solutions. So I made a, a real proper prototype with a proper design. And then I looked at it and I thought, well, this is really where the future is going to be. And, you know, every, everybody is looking now, all the VCs, the investors, they're all looking for investing in the everybody wants to be in steve jobs's garage you know basically uh, so everybody wants to invest in the next facebook and find the next company that's going to bring in money and generally investors are scared of hardware yeah because hardware is more complicated but if again i ask you kevin would you rather have invested in facebook or would you rather invest in apple well it's kind of a no-brainer you Pretty know like it's just, there is value in hardware. So I started making prototypes, and when I decided that I want to do this, I assembled a team of the six most wonderful engineers that I knew, doctors. I even have a poet laureate in my team. Really? You know? Very cool. Yeah, because for communication, because yeah. this is a, truly a story of love, and you know, we've built this beautiful, I call it a legend, but it's in fact a story. I mean, the truth about 
how it was developed and where we're going and why we're doing it. And this, for the last, it took me about six months to actually finalize the product. Yeah. And about two months ago, I started turning the, turning the key in terms of marketing. Sure. And since I've launched, I've won basically every single design and communication award that's available in Europe. Congrats, I'll man. That's great. I'll be at CES as well in Las Vegas in January. Oh, nice. But I've won the Janus of Design. I've won... Uh, I've won maybe five or six different prizes in the last couple of months. As a matter of fact, I'm going to win another prize tonight. They've just told me that I have to go off Congrats, and... Congrats, man. That's great. Get another trophy. Sure, you sure. Know. You're going to have to build a new mantle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, basically, the trophy is not really that important, but it's a fantastic means of communication. Well, and I think people. the thing that people forget is, like, yes, obviously, Apple's a hardware software company, but at the true essence of it, it's marketing, right? Like... They've yeah. always been brilliant at that, right? And they back it up with kind of the hardware and software side of things, right? And Absolutely. the most iconic ads, I think, from the last 20 or 30 years were a lot of them were done by, by them, right? Like, yeah, I still remember, yeah. I, I always remember. 1984. Yeah, totally. But I think the one <laughs> I that remember I remember that. the most is the when they had the like guy playing uh, Apple and the guy playing Windows and like every week they had a new one, and I remember like specifically waiting every week and going to watch the new commercial. Like who I know, I know. does I that, right? Like there's very few companies you're like I really want to see their new ad. <laughs> Absolutely, again, but it, again, it's all about communication. Sure. And communication is not a vulgar word. Communication is really how do you translate the essence of the company. And, the, and that's why I spend a lot of time on attention to detail. I offer that unconditional lifetime warranty on any of my products. Because, again, a lifetime warranty is meaningless. Sure. This is a beautiful product, all right? Sure. No question. But in 16 months, it'll be a dinosaur. Sure. It'll already have been replaced with version 2, with version 3. And so it's all about attention to detail. Do you, do you remember when Steve Jobs launched the, I, the yeah. iPod? Oh, yes. Remember he was standing there and he said, this is not an MP3. This is not a music player. This is a tool for the heart. Yeah. And if you can touch the hearts of people, the possibilities are infinite. Totally. And that's exactly it. When you touch the hearts of people, when people buy a product because they want to buy it rather than because they have to buy it, it makes all the difference. Totally. And <clears throat> I mean, the ramifications for this are just untold. Of course, there's the city ramifications. We have ramifications from the pharmaceutical, I mean, the, the cosmetics industry who wants me to make a luxury version for lipstick and nail polish and all that kind of stuff. But did you know, Kevin, that, for instance, every year in U USA, there's between 1,200 and 1,300 people who die following an organ transplant because when they get the organ... The organ is rotten. Sure, I could see that. I'm yeah, not that's kidding. Interesting. No, it's that's fair enough. Yeah. They take a plastic bucket, they put the organ inside, they close it, and then they run as fast as they possibly can. Sure. That's you know, so now that I've developed this technology to produce unlimited amounts of cold over with very little uh, power. Our uh, next step is going to be for me to extend it to organ transplant sure. and to whatever. The, the ramifications are just huge for the company. Sure. So we're, we're coming to the end of the show, but the one thing I do want to cover before the end is it connects to your smartphone. And how does that kind of, what does it show me on my phone? Absolutely. I mean, it might sound ridiculous. Why would you want to connect to a phone, a fridge? <laughs> well, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the interview, the biggest problem with these medications is not uh, the, only the fact that people can travel with them, but that people don't take it to work and therefore don't take the medication on time, what is called non-adherence. So the, this, the fridge will connect to the, to, the, to the mobile phone and then it will every 10 seconds record the temperature in real time, all that kind of stuff. It will also monitor the batteries, but it will also send you reminders. Hey, Kevin, last time you took your medication was at three o'clock this afternoon. Is it not time for you to take your medication so that we can improve the adherence to treatment and actually make you feel better and reduce the cost of your medication? Sure. No, but I think that's great. It is to actually make people feel better. Because oh. again, most, it come, you know, most people don't choose not to take the medication. They are put in that situation. In, same way, in many ways, it's pointless telling a fat person he's fat. You know, he knows that already. 
Sure. You know, I mean, you know. So how do you take a person and make him know he's overweight, and at the same time giving the tools of will and to do the micromanagement, the little decisions, and it's the little decisions every day that really make the difference. It's not that big stupid decision that you and me make on the thirty first of December. You know, the New Year's resolution. Yep. We know that doesn't work. <laughs> I should do the show on that. <laughs> but yeah, man. Uh, oh. We're at the end of the show, so let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about Life Inna and, uh, you know, kind of follow the progress and actually, you know, kind of check out you guys, the progress and get one in the Absolutely. kind of the new year. So uh, the, the easiest way to get daily information is either to log on to our Facebook page, the Life Inna Facebook page, or of course to go to the lifeinna.com website. It's available in multiple languages, English and French, and we're adding Spanish and German now in the next month. So, lifeinner.com, and or you just type in lifeinner, or you type my, na- type, my, uh, type my name on Google, and you'll one way or another you'll get there because it's, as I said, it's the product is going viral, and it's and it is such a cool project as well. That's great, man. Well, thanks again for taking the time under your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you. And have a good rest of your day. Come and have a drink in Paris, Kevin. Will do, man, next time. (laughs) All right, later, man. Bye. Cheers, man. Bye.